Welcome to Uncancelled Faith, a podcast that strives to break the culture of division, which so often segregates believers from one another. We're, We're your, your hosts, host, Joy Lucia Honeyball and Hannah Rose Russell. We're so excited to have you here today. This podcast is brought to you by Inspire Truth. Our mission at Uncancelled Faith is to create a space for people to share how the Lord is calling them to live, bringing a new perspective on subjects that so often become a topic of division. This is not a place for debate, but a time to share testimony, dive into some controversies, learn from one another, and discover how the Father wants to encourage us in our faith journeys. These episodes are recorded for the live Zoom audience. We also stream live on Facebook and YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to our channel for regular updates and the opportunity to join the Q&A at the end of each episode. Get ready, because Uncancelled Faith starts now. Well, hey everyone, welcome to Uncancelled Faith. This week, we're so excited to introduce our guest, Desiree Anna Duray, an incredible young woman with a heart for ministry. Welcome to Uncancelled Faith. How are you doing today? Oh, thank you so much for having me, Joy and Hannah. I am doing so well. It's so good to be out. Um, well, when we're recording this, it, we just came out of a lockdown. So it's nice to be out in the shops as well. I'm doing really well. How are you guys? Yeah, it's nice to be out, at least in, in the UK. It's nice to be out. I think the situation in Israel might be a little different. Yeah. Oh. yeah but we're doing really well, thanks. And uh, so why don't we just start... Uh, today's episode by you just telling us a bit about yourself, where you come from, your background, and how you uh, came to find your savior. And be saved. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So my name is Desiree, and um, that's originally apparently a French name, uh, but I have no French roots uh, whatsoever. Um, I was born in India, and so I lived there about like 10 years born in a good Christian family so like I think for me growing up God was always real I don't think there was ever a time where um, I didn't know about God and and then so yeah I grew up in India at about like until I was 10 and then we moved to Saudi Arabia because my parents were working there so I have a younger sister as well so my sister and I mom and dad moved and we lived in Saudi Arabia and um, that's where I would say at the age of 10 um, I really got to know God for me even though I grew up in a Christian home and like I said there wasn't a moment where I didn't know God I felt like I really knew him for who he was for me in Saudi Arabia it's really those three years 10 10 11 12 Um, So we didn't have big gatherings, we didn't have churches, we weren't allowed to meet, you know, and worship any other God, because for those of you who don't know, Saudi Arabia is a very predominantly strict Muslim country. And so they're very strict about, you know, not worshipping any other God than Allah and all of that. And so that meant no churches, no Bibles, all of that. But we still met as just two or three families just having a fellowship just, you know, um, reading Bible together and um, worshiping God together. And I think in that little group, in that little setting, away from a big platform is where I really encountered Jesus. I really knew who Jesus was, that, you know, it wasn't like in a Sunday school, although Sunday school is great. Um, it was actually in that main meeting of just conversations of listening, sitting under teachings and listening to people that I really fell in love with God for myself. And so from there, so I am about like 12 at this age, we moved to Northern Ireland, which is like a big jump from the Middle East to Northern Ireland. Um, And it's such a contrast to what Saudi Arabia is. Saudi Arabia is like nice and hot and, you know, and then you go to um, Northern Ireland, which is very wet and raining all the time. And summer is like, you know, like one day event. in the year um so yeah so we lived on the north coast which is like by the sea and and we lived in a place called Derry London Derry whichever way you 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 want to call it and so it was a lovely place that's where I spent all of my teenage years so I went to high school there secondary school so from 13 to 19 I lived in um, Northern Ireland and then we moved to Wolverhampton um where I live right now so we we've been here for four years coming up to five years which has been a crazy journey 
I always tell people by the time I was 20, I had lived in four different places and people always go, is that great? I'm like, eh, in and out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell. Wow, that's so interesting. So you're actually a dairy girl then, really? I am a like dairy the girl. the show. Yes. Wow. Yeah, when people watch that show, they're like, is that what it's like? Yes, that's what I grew up with. <laughs> wow. That, I mean, it, the the cult, the difference in culture is just so, so huge. Um, yeah. You couldn't have picked, uh, your parents couldn't have picked two more diverse cultures if they'd have tried Absolutely. three. Yeah. Um, so having moved to these different cultures and between these different places, um, what was it like being a young girl with such different expectations placed on women? Um, can you tell us what the cultural differences are? Yeah, definitely. So I think growing up in India, we're very like culturally, you know, um, women are not treated, um, you know, as you would see them here in the UK. So women are very much like second class citizens. Um, not now, but I think definitely when I was growing up, um, that's the mindset I grew up with. And I think culturally we would, um, the, the guy of the family or the guy in the room would have more say. And I think especially um, like if you had a job or different things, a guy would be preferred. Um, and then I think, so growing up with that, I always just knew like, you know, I don't have any brothers. I only, I'm the firstborn and I, um, I have a younger sister, that's all. But like we grew up with cousins and everybody and we just knew that, you know, like guys had a different standard to girls did certain shows guys can watch girls don't watch that certain way guys can sit girls don't sit that way there's a certain you know job that guys can do girls don't do that which we'll talk about later on which plays into a lot of like my choices I made and hesitations of God calling in my life and all of that and so that was very similar to what I experienced in Saudi Arabia except Saudi Arabia is like times a thousand um, to what it's like in India. So Saudi Arabia is very much, if you think about like the Old Testament, like that's like copy and paste where like women cover your face, women weren't allowed to vote, they weren't allowed to drive um, and all of that. But obviously a lot of that is their culture as well. And um, so even though we as Indians saw like there might've been a similarity, but theirs was very extreme, extreme of just like women don't walk alone. You know, you would hardly ever see that. And um, so those two are the ones that I experienced growing up. And I think moving to Northern Ireland, it was a little bit different because obviously there was a little bit freedom for women to become who they want to be, to speak a little bit more. There's still, I think, a lot of like, you know, restrictions on women um, in regards to, you know, what you can do and stuff like that. But growing up, I think, both India and Saudi Arabia had a big impact of um, the career choices I would make and the dresses I would wear and you know or what I would look like what a girl is supposed to look like or if you wanted to go into sports can you do that you know little things that we're like of course you can you can play football if you want to but like in a culturally like you know like in India or in Saudi Arabia that's just like no 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 girls don't do that <laughs> so yeah Wow, I'm just like thinking how much of a shock it would be to go to all these different cultures and even for your family, because I mean, you're young, you can adapt very easily to the different cultures, but then here's your family going to these different cultures, seeing all these things. Um, I know further down, we're going to talk about your family and what they think of yeah. how you're living today. Um, but I think that that would just be a shock to them as well, seeing all these different and then how it yeah. plays a role in how you were raised yeah um so i mean here you are you're you're seeing all these different um ways that women are expected to live um and and you're being brought up in these different cultures was it a surprise then i'm sure it was when um you heard the father call you into ministry and were you hesitant because of your upbringing and and how they've raised you in these cultures 
Um, yes, definitely. I think for me growing up, I always thought I was going to be a doctor, which is such a laugh. It really is. I laugh. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, that I am not a doctor. Like, I just I think about all the lives that are being saved right now because I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm just always like, oh, thank you, Jesus. But that's the expectation a little bit into my world is that everybody in India born into a family, Regardless of if you're a girl or a guy, I think the expectation is like, you know, you're either going to be, they say these three um, career choices, they say like, you're either allowed to be um, a doctor or lawyer or an engineer, or you can be a failure. Like there's no other options. It's like doctor, an engineer or lawyer. The fourth option is you can be a failure. So basically anything else other than those three options, you have failed in life. Um, which is very, I think, um, old fashioned. And I think um, just with India's history, I think predominantly it's just a very poor country. And I think to just work from up bottom upwards, they just thought, you know, you have to be a doctor, which, which has changed a lot now, which I'm really thankful for. And so that's, that's what I grew up in, you know? So I always thought I would be a doctor and it was always, you know, embedded into me. Both my parents are health professionals, mums and nurse doctors dad's a phlebotomist uh, but for him it was always full-time ministry for him phlebotomy was just something that paid the bills in the background sort of thing and um, so for me I had career orientated parents I still do and and so for me I always thought I would either be a doctor or at least second option is a nurse you know something still health related and so when I finished my um, A levels um, I started um, looking at, you know, different universities I could go to. And so my course that I picked was nursing and I got into like interviews and different things. And I always go, went to the interviews, uh, but then I wasn't successful to like go on to the actual course to do nursing, um, which was fine. Like I was just like, OK, maybe that's just not what God wants me to do. But I must confess, like four or five years later on, I was purely just doing it. Um, because it's just what was expected of me. And um, I knew my grades weren't adding up to be a doctor. So I was like, oh, I could be a nurse. And it wasn't because I was really passionate about being a nurse or anything. So when I didn't get in, I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. And so I decided to take a gap year and intern at the church I was in. So I turned 19 that summer, started interning for about like six, seven months in the church I was in in Northern Ireland. And during this time, my parents decided they'd move to um, Wolverhampton, to England, where their jobs took them. Um, so I lived on my own with the host family. And I must say, that is when I just realized the God's call on my life. Just being an intern in the office, doing everything, whether it's kids ministry or, you know, youth ministry. I was like, I think this is what God wants me to do. And it was such a shocker for me. I remember my... Um, um, my line manager at that time, he's like, well, that's gonna really annoy your parents. And I was like, yep. <laughs> he's like, they're not gonna like that. And I was like, yep, but we'll work it out. So it was such a shocker for me, but I was so relieved because I was like, I always wanted to do something that I really, really loved. And I knew I loved God. I knew I wanted to serve him. But at the same time, being a woman, comes with its challenges but I think being a firstborn kid in an Asian family comes with a lot of challenges as well because you're expected to set the stone you're expected to set um the pathway the right pathway for the younger ones to follow um, and I had loads of cousins looking up to me as well they're all like they're all in India so they're all like oh you live in London even though I don't I tell them a million times I live in England not in London but they're very much like you live in London you know so you're gonna be a doctor you're gonna be a nurse and it's like nope I work in church this is what God's calling me to do so it was a complete shock for me when God said um you know this is what I want you to do and it came with its challenges of like trying to make mom and dad understand that and then like wider family understanding that what does ministry mean finances just not coming through and then out of nowhere coming through and um, which is a big testimony in itself as well wow amazing so I mean it sounds like God's really taken you on a journey over the you know 
growing up and over the last few years to to get to to where you are now you know and he I mean he does work in very surprising mysterious ways and doesn't always yeah. tell us um you know what he has in store um way in advance so I'm I'm curious what what ministry roles you've had um obviously you mentioned the internship but but what is your history in ministry and and what roles um you have now and what that looks like yeah so um I started off when I was 19 so as an intern I think uh, predominantly my role was just to help out be available anywhere which I think is so key I think especially if you're starting out in ministry just to be available say yes to everything so I did everything from like um, making coffee for uh, teams which was where I learned amazing coffee making skills I would recommend that to everybody um, and then yeah and also helping out in kids church helping out in youth whether it's behind the scenes or actually on the day and um, whether it's leading games or leading a session um, so that was in Northern Ireland I did all that and then moved to Wolverhampton where I'm currently based in an amazing church called All Nations. And um, so I started yet again as a volunteer, as an intern and um, doing kids and youth work um, mainly. And then that transitioned into um, leading a team in kids, just like not the whole team, but like a one team on a separate Sunday, just leading them and the kids. And then that moved on to actually now um, leading the whole team of um you know kids workers and the kids team so that's the role i've had i've also been able to um lead within the youth team um, and also speak to the youth which is like i think you know women preaching is just a very controversial topic for everybody i think well so for some people and um so yeah i've had the opportunity to just speak into the lives of young people or lead a lesson or a session for kids which i just um think is such a huge privilege and i think it also sets a huge um example for them as well uh, especially in our church, we're very multicultural. We've got Africans, we've got Asians, we've got uh, British, like, to, uh, uh, and then we've got like just people from everywhere, Germany, everywhere here. So I think it's so amazing to see that come into play as well. And then outside of, um, so that's my ministry. That's that's my main job. That's what I do. Um, and then outside of that, recently I've started to volunteer at A21. So I started that in February this year, which is where I met the lovely Joy. Um, so yeah, I started to volunteer. Um, everything has been online on Zoom. And I just love their heart and culture, like just to rescue people, regardless of where they're from, regardless of their gender. It's both men and women just coming together, just getting the work done. And I love that. So in A21, I um, help with a lot of schools work. So I work with kids and young people basically a lot. And so I help with um, just, you know, getting that together to going into schools. How do we, you know, raise awareness um, for A21? And um, it is for those of you who don't know, sorry, I should have mentioned A21 is a nonprofit organization that helps fight against human trafficking. It was for... Um, the founders of them are um, Christine Kane and Nick Kane, amazing people with amazing heart. And we've got an amazing UK team that I get to be a part of. That's so cool. And what you're doing is amazing. I, I love hearing your story and hearing um, how God is leading you in all of this. So yeah. how have you experienced him um, working in your life now that you're walking in obedience to the calling he's given you? I, I mean, was it scary to step out? And how were you able to turn that fear into trust? Yeah, um, it's absolutely so scary. Like every single time, every time God speaks, it's like, I don't think I can do that. And I'd like to take back to like, remember like when I was 19 and I felt I had to do this internship. And I remember looking at that flyer and the cost it would take me. So this internship was an unpaid internship, but you paid for it. So you actually invested in it. Um, and then, yeah, it paid for like different courses, different um, books they would give you and things. Um, so it, it was self-funded and I remember looking at this amount and I just remember being like, God, I don't think I can afford this for the next seven months. 
Um, and then, but I just, you know, I was speaking to a few people and they were just like, you know what, you just got to do it because finance would always be in your way. Like, nobody has enough money ever but if god's called you to do it he'll provide so what i decided to do is have a nice coffee morning and i'm telling you christians love their coffee it's like their christian drug or something right so i had a coffee morning at um at our house in northern ireland and i kid you not the amount that i had to start for the first four months it was like more than more than I needed it was just like nicely there I didn't fund any of it none of the money came from me and it was just all people just pouring into it and then I had one sponsor um, from that coffee morning who said hey I'm gonna pay 50 pounds into your back bank account every month now until you finish this internship and I was like that was so amazing. And then um, when I found out mom and dad had to move because their jobs were going to take them there and I had to live on mine, I was like, oh no, this is like rent. Now I need to pay rent to live somewhere. And my host family turned around and said, we just want to bless you. Please don't pay us rent. It's just crazy things like that where I'm like, God, you are so good. And, I, and that's the thing I'm saying. If you really feel that God is calling you to do something, step into it and say yes to it. Like, Forget about the practicals. It never makes sense in the natural. Um, but at the right time, just things, money came through and different people. I think in when you're an intern in our church in Northern Ireland, people just love you. They invite you and feed you every Sunday. They give you lifts. They take you everywhere. You're just like a celebrity. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, but I was so privileged to experience God's hand at different stages throughout that internship. And then I think even now, after I finished the internship, I didn't have an idea of what to do or where God's calling me. It was always like, I would always say they were like, it just accidentally happened. Um, but I feel like that's just exactly how God works. It's just right timing, right people in the right place. And I remember walking into our church in Wolverhampton in all nations and um, the ass assistant pastor at that time, he came over to me and he just said, oh, you know, what's your name? And, and I started speaking and he was all like, where are you from? And I was like, oh, I'm from India. He's like, no, your accent says you're from somewhere else. And I explained my whole story and he's like, no way. We want somebody to help us with like some of like admin and some of this and that. And he introduced me to the lady who was leading the kids ministry at that time, who's like my very good friend now and like really best friends now. And, and we met, like, it was just like accidentally happened. I didn't walk into it saying, this is what I want. And it just, yeah, and we, and she met with me and she was all like, you know what? Yeah, let's just do it. Like come into the offices and, um, you know, help me with like cutting and printing out crafts, preparation, this and that. It was the little yeses. It was once a week that I went in and said, yeah, I can give four or five hours to help you with the printing, to help you with photocopying, to help you with like preparing crafts for kids, which led to like those bigger steps, those steps that God um, had for me at that time did I know that two three years down the line this would be my full-time job this would be my full-time ministry absolutely not I had a part-time job there just to support family and just pay bills and different things um, uh, but I'm so glad that I said yes to those four hours on a Wednesday I clearly remember that I, I always call it a four hours on a Wednesday was my big step into what God called me to because it wasn't it wasn't something glamorous it wasn't something sexy it wasn't something like you know God opened the heavens and no it was just the ordinary the simple yes walking by faith did I know the whole picture? No. And I'm so glad that God didn't give me the whole picture when I moved to Overhampton because I would have freaked out. And I said, I'm at, this is it. Bye. Like if he had shown me five years from now, this is where you'll be. I'll be like, there's no way I'm at. Bye. That's not for me. But I'm so glad God just led me one step at a time. And each step has been amazing and surprising in the way he provided It's so inspiring to hear how you've walked in obedience and how, you know, over time your your faith and your trust in God has been strengthened over, um, like you said, even something as simple as finances um, and God coming through at the right time is just so amazing when that when that happens. It's such a it's such a testimony. 
Um, so A21, we've, yep. we've both worked there f together for quite a while now and it's been such an honor to, to work with you um, there. Um, I know for myself that it's been a massive part of my development in the last year and, yep. and the organization has really grown and strengthened me as a person. Can you tell us a little bit about how working in A21 has impacted your view, um, particularly of women's roles um, in your personal life and also in the professional workplace? Yeah, definitely. I think working, um, I think like being in full-time ministry is so great, but at the same time, when you work for a, a non-profit organization, you look at like a lot of things that they do because they're not only just doing, you know, um, God's calling them to do, but also they are doing um, a lot of things out there in the world so like a21 now works with like schools and different organizations and they work with like um rescue departments so like police officers and airports and different all these like secular world um areas where they go into and you just know that they are doing um things in a way that just doesn't make sense in the natural so even how they empower women and rescue women and how women are treated within the team, which I'm sure Joy can like vouch for that, is just amazing. There's like, there is no segregation of like a guy is talking right now or a girl is talking right now. No, it's very much guys and girls, we're talking together, we're having a conversation. So I think in our team meetings, I love her team meetings where everybody just, you know, chips in, everybody's voices are heard, everybody's welcome to have an opinion. And one idea is not above another idea because it came from a guy or a girl, but it's it's assessed the same way. So I think in a professional way, they do that amazingly to invite the conversation from both gender. And for me personally, watching that has been so encouraging because um, you know that in I know friends that I have people um, who don't work for a Christian organization or who are not in ministry, just in the secular world. And they just strongly, you know, see that where like just because they are a woman and, you know, their ideas aren't taken seriously or it's more like I'm a guy I'm talking, just, you know, listen to my ideas sort of thing. But we never experienced that in A21, which is amazing. And um, in the short time I've been there, so it was February, March, April, May. So about like four months now. Um, the short time I've been in there, I've always felt so welcomed and my voice is always heard and th so there's like two guys on our team and the rest of them are girls uh, but it's just like having like two big brothers on the team you know just having banter it has never been like male dominant or female dominant it's just like let's just all have banter uh, and that's just what the kingdom of God is, is as well isn't it so both women and men coming together and and I think that's why the work at A21 is very effective because it's not just a guy's role or a um, woman's role. It's more of like women and guys coming together and just working towards that one common goal, which is amazing. I love that there's this connection um, at A21, especially when you're um, working for such an amazing cause that you're able to be in unity together and there's not this um, gender um competition of, no. of who who is higher than the other or anything like that um so then we've talked about a21 um that being a nonprofit organization what has your experience been like then in the church um in kids ministry and in the other um types of ministry that you've worked with how have um people responded because i mean i know that you look at kids ministry and people can be like oh well that's a woman's place anyway yeah so have you noticed anything um in that that um that has impacted you yeah definitely i think um so growing up i think culturally for me um so i was always thought like you know if you were the youngest in the room you don't speak um, sort of, it was just a cultural thing. I don't think it was anything reflective of my household. I think if you ask any Asian kid, like regardless of if they were a guy or a girl, they were like, okay, if guests are coming, you sit down really quiet, best behavior. And most importantly, you don't talk 
do not speak over anybody do not speak especially if they're wrong don't say anything if they're older then they have to be right so that's the mentality just set in the background that's the mentality i grew up in so for me stepping into ministry when i was 19 and sitting in a staff meeting and it's like first of all everybody's a guy and they're all in their 40s full grown women here i am a 19 year old little girl sitting in a staff meeting at our church in northern ireland and i am super quiet like for the first 3 months i'm like super quiet because i'm like they're older than me they know they got it covered you know so staff meetings always like me just nodding uh huh yeah yeah and then one day my line manager pulled me aside and he just said we've got to have a conversation, Desiree. And I was like, oh no, what's he going to talk about? And he goes, um, like, uh, you're a lovely person and you know, you're very quiet, gentle, sweet, but like, I want you to know you have a voice. Like, um, and then I love the approach he took on it because um, he obviously didn't just tell me what to do, but he was so understanding. And he was like, I don't know if this is cultural. I don't know if this is the way you were brought up, but like, you can speak up in these meetings too, you know, like, I'm pretty sure there's things that we miss because we're all guys. And, you know, we miss maybe uh, uh, something that comes from a girl's perspective, or maybe the way that you think that you can contribute to the team, like you don't have to sit there in silence. And he said, but sometimes, you know, just sitting there in silence, not saying anything can also come across as rude for me, which I was like, "How? I thought I was being so respectful by being so quiet how am I being rude you know but that just really was a key changing point in my life to know actually you know what this is what the kingdom of God looks like where you're invited to have a conversation at the table and you're allowed to bring these opinions which is so contrast to what I grew up with even in church settings kids or were just told to be quiet and women did not preach especially in Saudi Arabia where I grew up they didn't didn't preach and they didn't lead any aspects of it it was like oh you can be on the worship team because you know that's a woman's role or you can sing you know because that's what women can do or you can lead Sunday school because that's what women do Uh, but it wasn't you wouldn't see a woman standing up to preach and that was so that's what I grew up with and I took that into that setting of in the staff meeting um, at 19 year olds. And that really changed me. And that really helped me to understand, actually I have a voice and I can speak into this as well, which helped me grow in my confidence. Um, which you're probably like, oh, I thought you were confident. No, like, I hope, I wish you'd met me when I was at 19, completely different Desiree to what you're seeing right now. Um, so yeah, and so when I stepped into my full-time role as a, um, um, as a kid's lead right now and um, a lot of people do say you know oh that that's you know that that makes sense because you know it's just what a girl would do you know kids ministry you know because you don't see guys doing it and I'm like no a guy can do this too it's not a guy's role and a girl's role and um, so for me even like you know having that to say being like look it, it's not a typical girl's role and my ver- my heart is that that I would add more guys on the team who actually be like hey look this is something that both gender can do and um, so yeah that's where I'm at with it I loved that you mentioned that this is what the kingdom of God looks like is yeah. us working together because we read the Bible and so often people miss or forget that women were like one of the main people who supported yeah. uh, Jesus Yeshua in his ministry. They were the ones raising money. They were speaking it. And they're also the ones that uh, he like revealed himself to a lot of the time. Yeah. So we can get so caught up in the disciples and, and how they were men. And it's like, but look at all the women that were there too. And they are in the Bible and they did yeah. have a voice. It wasn't like they were just sitting there quietly. They're listening. They're sharing it. And um, and they were used yeah. greatly. And that's why um, even today, um, how we continue that, because we all have a purpose in the kingdom of God. And sometimes that is being a stay-at-home mother, being yeah. a wife, um, a housemaker. It's totally a God-given Fine, yeah. calling. But Mm -hmm. there's also other callings like in ministry and like in other um, jobs, because no job is greater or less in the kingdom. So I just I just wanted to say that that was really cool that you mentioned that because that's something we miss sometimes. Definitely. And I think I loved how you said like there were like 
followers um, of Christ who were who were women as well. And like, and it just like, it, you like there's certain things that a girl does, certain things a guy does, and that those are strengths. We have strengths, you know, and that's okay. It's not wrong to have that. Like, you know, maybe um, as girls, we are a lot more emotional. And I think that could play to our strengths uh, in the kingdom of God. It doesn't have to be a drawback. And that's why I think it's so important that both men and women serve in the kingdom of God because there's some certain things that a woman brings that only a woman can bring and the certain thing that a guy brings that only a guy can bring and that's okay that's why we're different that God wired us like that and that's that's not a negative but yeah let's not use those things as a negative thing be like oh that's a girl's no no bring the girl in oh that's a guy's job no no bring the guy in let's Mm -hmm. play on our strengths that's why we all have the strengths and weaknesses. And yeah. It's so important to use that together to build it up. If you just do the, the strengths of one and not the other, then yeah. you're going to have that downfall. It's so mm. true. Yeah. It's like what Paul says, isn't it? That we're all the body of Christ and like each part plays a different role and that's okay. And, um, and I think sometimes we forget each part, you know, we just talk like, oh, each part is a gift. This now each part can is also gender, like each gender plays a role in the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love what what you guys are saying. Um, it's interesting, you you keep mentioning, oh, you know, if you'd have, have seen me, you know, when I was 19, and what I'm like now. So clearly, over the last few years, there's been a big change as you've grown and developed um into the woman you are today pursuing god's yeah. calling for your life um i'm super curious how your family has taken it how your family has responded to your chosen lifestyle mm-hmm. um how your family has coped with watching you develop in the way that you have um and also how they've maybe responded to situations where they've felt perhaps that you've needed this really stable um high power career to get by in life and god and then they've watched god provide for you um in in ministry yeah so like i I have amazing parents who just love god who love jesus so i was really surprised when i told them you know um, i'm gonna go into ministry and i was really surprised when their reaction was like you don't want to do that, you know, because I thought, genu- I genuinely thought they were going to be like, yeah, they're going to be like on board. They're going to be like, yes, let's do it. But they're very much like, no, you know, maybe when you get married, you know, your your husband can be in ministry, you can support him. Uh, but like, it's really hard. They were just like, it's really hard being a girl in ministry. They were like, one, being in ministry is hard. And then second, you're a girl, it's going to be like extra hard don't do it. So they were just thinking it from a very practical side and it was coming from a good place. It wasn't coming from like a place of like anything harmful or anything. It was just, I think they were very concerned. And like I mentioned, I'm the first born kid. So they've never walked this with another kid before. So everything is so new. I'm a girl, I'm first born. So they just wanted to make everything right for me obviously God had different plans and I remember just battling with it being like oh God I don't know what to do and then there's that little bit of you like oh do I disobey mom and dad but although it's not disobeying because you're obeying God and there's so many thoughts that would go through my mind but obviously I knew ultimately I'm going to do what God's calling me to do and so I step into it I'm just still you know um, working in church or like volunteering in church and I was in my schedule even though I'm not getting paid for it or anything I would prioritize being in church prioritize volunteering Friday nights for youth and Sundays for kids and church I'd prioritize that so I'd work my part-time schedule around it part-time work and I remember mom and dad being like no you need a stable job so they're like okay they got to a point where they're like okay you're going to do ministry anyway so get a nine to five job during the week and then in the weekends you can do ministry they're trying to make this work towards me the way they want it to and I love I laugh at it right now it's so it's so funny because obviously they're very concerned they want what's best for me um, but I just knew, no, if I took a nine to five job, I knew I would, yeah, it would pay the bills. Yeah, it, it would be successful career, whatnot. But I knew deep down I'd be so miserable because I wasn't doing what God was calling me to do. And so I take on this job anyway with that, you know, at church, I do this full time job now. 
uh, full-time ministry and still mom and dad very much like this is like two years ago I think they're very much still like oh I'm not sure I'm not sure if this is what you should be doing you know you're in your 20s there's so much more you can do this is the time to invest you know in your life and this and that and then um at about like 2019 um you know my dad is living in India at this moment and like he's getting all his visa and different things getting processed to come back to the UK and he rings me just you know just we just have a moment and he just tells me he's like you know what just do what God calls you to do and I was so like I was like what (laughs) I was just like what and he's very much like yeah you know no degree is gonna give the satisfaction that Jesus is gonna give you and I was like this is what I've been trying to tell them for like all of my life. Like, where have they been? So it just came a full circle, but I truly believe it was all God just working in their hearts and taking them on a journey as well. Um, And then now, even right now, like even as recently as a month ago, like mom and dad both sat down and they were like, you know what, this is the call of God on your life. We want to support you. And, you know, don't worry about like people have a degree, have a successful career, this and that, you know, if this is what God's calling you to do, do it. So it went from like, you're a girl, it's going to be really hard. Don't do it to like, just do what God's calling you to do. And I think a lot of that was just God personally journeying with them as well, which is a big testimony because obviously you want your parents blessing. It wasn't like they weren't blessing me in it. It's just, they walked through that themselves. So like dad is in full-time ministry as well. And um, for us growing up, obviously there's been times where there wasn't enough and then we'd always live day by day. And God's been so faithful where he just literally provides day by day, finances, food, clothes just day by day and I think they didn't want that for me but they loved seeing that for everybody else and I think as a parent for them it's a little bit hard and a little bit you know nerve-wracking when you see your kid that like okay this could be their future they could be suffering what I suffered and which I don't know maybe I'll think like that when I'm a mom too I don't know (laughs) maybe it's just a parent's perspective but I love God just really transformed them. And I think for them to see that how God has provided for me day to day and just even financially and different ways and different confirmations, I think that really helped their minds to be at peace to say, if this is what God's calling her to do, we're going to have to release her to do it. It's totally a parental perspective. My parents are the exact same way I've grown up in ministry as well and the same as you just going day by day and um, my mom has always been like I don't want this life for you yeah go and like do something and and my dad would just be like just listen to God (laughs) so I had those two um and then yeah and then he's just leading me and it's definitely not what the rest of my family um agree with I mean I'm constantly getting asked oh when are you going to college or what are you doing with your life and if you say some stuff they're just like well is that it is that all you're gonna do so what about the like your extended family are they in England or are they still in India and how have they responded because I know that your parent your parents blessing is like the most important but then you also have to deal with the rest of the family and what do you say to them (laughs) especially when they're not there to see everything yeah so um the rest of my family all are in India so we're the only ones that have moved um to England so the rest of them are in India and like um they um the majority of them are not Christians so like they definitely don't get this lifestyle at all. They don't understand it. So I have this one uncle who I ring, you know, constantly talk to. Um, and he just, you know, just makes me laugh every single time because I just know where this conversation is going to go. That He always rings me and he's just like, yeah, so what are you doing? I'm like, like, yeah, I still work at church. He's like, yeah, like, do you get paid for it? I'm like, yeah, I do. He's like, can you move up in that career? And I, I have to like all the time explain to him, this is not a career. This is not one of those jobs. And, you know, it's very hard because he obviously isn't a believer. He, um, He's Hindu, so like he doesn't believe in Jesus. So it's so hard to explain to somebody who doesn't get kingdom culture in the first place and then to explain like yeah I'm in ministry so in his mind he's still very much like 
Are you going to go to university, get a degree, you know? And sometimes you'd be like, if you want to get married, you've got to have a great stable job. And I was like, thank you. Like I always say, thank you, uncle. It's fine. But yeah, rest of my family don't get it. But they're very supportive still though. Like my cousins are just like, it's your life. You can do what you want with it. Uh, the uncles and aunties are very much like, yeah, like, yeah, you get paid. It's fine. But there's always this one or two that are always like, you need to go to university like right away before it's too late. <laughs> My family is the exact same way. I totally, yeah. I totally get you. <laughs> yeah. So it's something they, they don't understand at all. I, uh, I really relate to that. Uh, having, um, I have a lot of people in my family who aren't Christians um, and it's it's quite hard to explain explain to them I'm not only just kind of why I want to do ministry or why I'm working in the areas I'm working in but also how even um, the things that aren't involved with ministry but the other interests of my life like music for example how I use that for the kingdom and how I use that to honor God it's very hard to explain that um, to you know non-christian family members but i like you i've been very surprised by um a lot of um really support from them even though they don't understand they'll they'll still support and yeah. they'll still say well go for it um you know and they're proud of me so i you know i think it's wonderful to have supportive family even if they're not all you know believers um it's you know it's still it's still really good um i'm curious where where you think god is calling you in the future um yeah and how your testimony can help others yeah so i definitely think um, and this has only been like very very clear to me in the last year or so i definitely think in the future god's um i think where god really wants me is in women's ministry uh, but to also change how women's ministry is has been perceived because it's always very like girly and it's always like, you know, let's be a wife and a mom. But I feel like girls and women are just called to be more than that, you know, that that it's not your primary calling. Your primary calling is a daughter of God. You know, that's your primary identity. And being a daughter of God comes with authority as well to release people in the kingdom. And so I'd, I'd say like, I, I would love, I think this is what God is calling me to do, to be in women's ministry, to empower other women and um, to be a big sister, because I feel like I'm a bit too young to be a big mom, uh, maybe, maybe in like 20 years time. Uh, but to be that big sister, to, especially to those younger girls um, who are, you know, struggling um, to step into the calling that God has for them, especially when it's like 18 19 that really key turning point in your life where you make those career choices but just not to you know make choices because it's just what culture demands of you or the society demands of you but to do what actually is this what god's calling you to be and you know for, for a lot of them god is calling them to go into that secular world work, work in that office be a doctor be an engineer be a lawyer be a musician be uh, a writer and that's fine but like I think um, just helping them understand that you know just because they're a woman they don't have to be limited to a job or to a section of what like <laughs> the society says they are so I feel like definitely in the future and um, I'll probably move a lot from kids to um, predominantly pouring into young women and and just women's ministry as well. That's an excellent thing to um, aspire to be like, especially for that age group, because you're, you're totally right. I mean, you get to the end of school and all of a sudden it's like you've been leading up to what do you want to do after school? But yeah. then when it's after school, you're like, oh, I actually have to think about it. And that's mm -hmm. when the pressure comes on. Like, well, you have like your family saying, how can you make the most money? What degree are you yeah. going to get? And so when you have ministries and churches that, um to single out okay let's look at the calling um that god has placed because we all have a calling and it comes in yeah. all forms and shapes and sizes and whatever and how how can god use you and then and the whole thing i love jordan rayner is my all-time favorite um non-fiction author um and he's always saying um just about how how working is so is so impacting and that we only have we have two things in life when we are believers um that we are called to do 
and we can do that in any job and that is to serve others and to bring glory to god Mm -hmm. so if we're if we do those two things and no matter what we do we are we are spreading that and and we're an impactful part of the kingdom of god so i love that you want to encourage other girls to um pursue the callings on their lives yeah absolutely so do you have any encouragement i know that um that you want to be an encouragement to others so do you have any encouragement or bible verses for our listeners um to meditate on um as we come to the end of this of this episode yeah definitely um i would say you know just take it back to the basics you know let's go back to the beginning and um, genesis you know that um verse of how like god created man and women i just love that i'm just like you know it talks about how god creates man and women in his image and the image of God he created them both male and female I love that version because I'm just like both male and female that we're both created by the same creator and just to even remember that that's where identity comes from we are in the image of God that he created us and he's given us our special talents and uh, special gifts that he wants you to bring to the table as a woman. He wants you to bring to the table as a man that only you can bring. And we want to celebrate that. And then I just wanted to look at this one person in the Bible who I love so much and I admire. And it's not like a big chapter on her, um, but it's Deborah. Deborah chap- uh, and she, you can find her story in Judges chapter 4. She is such a boss. I call her like a boss woman um, where she's like a prophetess. Her husband um, is, you know, I think he's part of the generals. And so like, you know, they come to him, they come to Deborah at this time. And she's like apparently like a judge at that time to just ask about this battle. And she, she just says, you know, this is what you need to do, this and that. And the women say, and the men say, like, will you come with us? You know, that's like one of the, first times where like a woman is invited to like this battle and we see how Deborah led this army of men into battle like she is such a boss woman in a time where they weren't allowed to do that and she just listens to the voice of God and says this is what we need to do she brings structure she brings um, that administration skills and not only that but leads alongside men which is exactly what God wants us to do, men and women to come together, stand side by side, lead alongside into the women. And, the, and obviously they win the battle. And I love her story. I love her story of just leading, but also love um, Ruth's story, which I would encourage anyone listening, both guys and girls to read the book of Ruth. It's only about like four chapters. You could probably read it in one setting. But I love Ruth's servant heart. Um, of just leaving everything behind and following her mother-in-law to a country she doesn't know but it's because she loved God she said hey the God you worship is my God as well and she follows um, her mother-in-law and how she just serves her mother-in-law by being at this field and then just being obedient in the unseen and how God just lifts her up she marries Boaz who turns out to be the guy who owns the field and who's actually their redeemer, who's rightfully meant to be marrying them. And it's just, I just love how God works in these two women. One is seen as a really strong leader and she leads who's Deborah. And the other one is like, she's also a very strong leader, but maybe not at the battle front, but not at the battle line, but at the behind the scenes, she's led and God sees her and lifts her up. Uh, And I would say to anybody watching, a guy or a girl, that you know what, God's given you the special talents, whether that may be up front or whether that may be behind the scenes. It could be you sitting there emailing. It could be you standing in front of people preaching. Both of those are equal and both of those are equally needed in the kingdom. Um, And and I I just love this um, author called Lisa Bevere. I don't know if you guys have um, listened, know who Lisa Bevere is. She's from America and she wrote this book called Without Rival. And it's it's for girls, it's for women. And it talks about just how like women, we compare each other. But in that book, she puts in a chapter called Gender Without Rival and talking about how like both men and women of God are needed to serve in the 
kingdom of God. And she puts in this line, uh, this lion, and she studies about like lions. And she's like doing a lot of research about lions. And then she comes across this interesting fact, which always sticks out to me. She talks about how lions are the best killers, but lionesses are the best hunters so both in the natural and the animal kingdom both the male lion and the female lion work together to get the food the common goal is to get dinner on the plate but the lioness does the work of actually hunting and finding the best prey the best food and then the lion jumps in because he's the best killer and they like playing tag team and I was like the animal kingdom gets this. Why don't we as God's kids don't get this, that both men and women play their parts. Uh, and I think uh, the common goal is to bring the gospel to the lost and broken world. And for that, we need men and women to rise up. And I think if, if a guy is watching this, like uh, my encouragement to you would be whether it's your sister, your mom, your your wife, your girlfriend, or your daughter in the future, don't box them up because they are a girl, you know, call, call out the call of God on their life, speak life into them. And if you're a girl watching this, don't box yourself out because of culture or society saying you are needed in this kingdom, you are needed and God picked you and he put you in this time of eternity at this right time, this place, because he needs you and he wants you to be in the kingdom. And I would encourage you what Josh, uh, what God said to Joshua in Joshua chapter one, verse nine, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Because why? Because God's going to be with you all the time. Yeah, is it scary? It's so scary. It's so scary stepping into the call of God on your life, especially in a culture. I think with this episode, we're talking about women in ministry and being a woman. It's hard. It's 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 going to you're going to have people doubt, you know, people who are going to sow lies into your mind. But, you know, remember Joshua 1, 9, where God commands Joshua and it's a command for every single one of us women and men in the kingdom of God is to be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid for the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go and whatever you do, he's going to be with you and he's called you. All you have to do is be strong and courageous. Just stand in that firm faith that if God's called you to do this, he will bring you through it. That's super encouraging. That's so encouraging. I've, I've loved what, what you're saying. I think, you know, as, as young women and, you know, young men as well, like we need to hear that and our society and our culture needs to hear that. And especially in the Christian community with so many um, divided opinions on what women's roles should be, you know, in the church is really important to hear that and to take it back to the Bible and look at how God used women in the Bible. I love Deborah. I love Ruth. Like they've been super inspiring for me growing up. Um, so yeah, that's, it's super great um really really good stuff and i think you're gonna encourage a lot of women um in the way that god is calling you um so we are going to open it up for some questions if anyone in the audience has some questions you are now able to um um, unmute yourselves if you'd like to ask a question um and if you'd like to turn your camera on as well we just want to remind you that this is being recorded and will be posted online later so if you're comfortable um, feel free to unmute yourselves, um, turn on your camera and ask Desiree a question. All right, so I guess no comments tonight, um, but we thank everyone for joining the second episode of Uncancelled Faith. We pray that this podcast will be a blessing to you. Thank you to Desiree for joining us and sharing your incredible testimony. Um, it was so inspiring, so impactful. And um, yeah, I just pray that this um, word will go out to others to encourage them. If you want to receive updates when our next show will be, um, you can find us on social media at Uncancelled Faith Podcast or at inspire-truth.com slash Uncancelled Faith. We hope that you all have an excellent night and day wherever you are in the world. Um, And yeah, thank you so much for joining.